Well, this is Taylor Sound Presents Music Masters. This is our second installment, and we are here with Ryan Alcott of 12 Rods and many other different bands. I'm sure we'll touch on the different <coughs> acts and uh, things that you've done over the years. Um, I was introduced to you, um, I don't know, probably, it was probably before Split Personalities. There was somebody, I used to have a little studio over it. Did, did, had you ever heard of Mirror Image? Does that name sound um, It sounds familiar. I don't know. Anyway, Dana Bailey and Bill Bailey, those guys did like records for Run Westy Run and Tina the B-Sides and many, many other shit. The fucking Shit Biscuits was their band. Remember, do you remember that name? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. So, and the, there was a guy there that was kind of, he lived there. It was kind of like a, a bunch of folks that just lived there and hung out. Uh, had his two studios in the basement, and he gave me a cassette, and was just like, "You gotta see these guys. This is like whole new level, you know." And, and then I, you know, went to Seventh Street a few times, and was super impressed, super into what you guys were doing. And I was kind of going back through your catalog of over the last week, and it just hit me as to. The chordings. Let's just talk. Let's just talk about chordings for a minute. Because what you guys were doing was just. It was like. It was there was it was heavy. It was chill. It was jazzy. There was a lot of stuff going on there. But I think what it comes down to is the intervals, the chords, and of course the 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 drum. I mean the time signatures. There was grooves and beats that you were playing around with. Mm -hmm. you want, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, uh, yeah, sure. It was, um, well, we were all just musicians, you know, growing, growing up as musicians, kids, and musical families, you know, it's just, with that advantage and privilege, you just, you know, you get more academic uh, concepts in your mind, you know, theory, uh, polyrhythms, and, 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 and such that, you know, I was, had fam, you know, dad who would who would wake me up every morning playing his trumpet, you know, which would do scales and arpeggios, and he would I mean, he was a, he was also a, an arranger and a publisher of music who would always be at behind the piano playing jazz chords. He's a jazz musician. My mom also was you know a very proficient pianist and clarinetist and so forth. And um, you know, I, you grow up around a lot of progressive music uh, in the legit territories, uh, jazz and. And, and, and classicals and so forth. And uh, it comes down to most of that. Uh, I had this parallel life of being a, a studied musician and then also having kind of a punk rock lifestyle. And I would live those simultaneously. I would, you know, skate all day, then come home at night and practice, you know, vibraphone for four hours. <laughs> and I, I didn't really make the connection between the two for a while. And I wasn't like, playing punk rock music, but I was definitely like listening to it. And, but it wasn't until like near the end of high school when I was asked to like uh, start a band for a party, you know, for a graduation party. And it was like two weeks before the party and it was kind of like with my friends and we were all just saying, well, who's going to play what? We all played mu music, but we all like, there's two drummers and a couple of guitarists, but no one played, say, the bass or would sing or whatever. So it was just thrown into a position very quickly of like, oh, okay, I guess I got, to, I got to sing and play guitar, learn how to play guitar and be a front man. And, you know, with the knowledge that I had with like, you know, I also played Suzuki violin at a very young age. And it was within two weeks, I had to, you know, you, I had to write a lot of songs, like 12 plus songs for this party. And uh, of course, you know, just based off my learnings, it was just, chord became progressive. Uh, there was a lot of, you know, minor or major sevens in there or just you know sharp this and that and it wasn't intentional it's just i liked those sounds and but i also liked the heaviness of you know rock music and punk and so forth so you know without being heavy-handed i would always just try to find subtle ways to play like a different chord um kind of out of in a strange naivete not knowing that you know some notes aren't really always, you know, 
the, even though they might sound good to me, and maybe at a theoretical level or whatever, they just, you know, maybe weren't the most conventional chords to use. But it was just how I heard music. And, you know, I'd pick up a guitar and my hand would just go to a certain chord that was just kind of, you know, had an extra, you know, additional note or two. And with that, it's just, it was not a forced issue. I wasn't trying to make progressive music. It was just what was just already in my head through just countless years of just hearing, you know, legit music. And, um, you know, I was, you know, I, I guess I, I, it was very, pretty easy for me to figure out how to write a melody over that pretty quick. I remember a very specific time when we got our first computer and my dad would had to teach um, in college. Uh, he was assigned to teach, you know, early computer courses, MIDI and so forth back in the, you know, late 80s and so forth. And he would come home with these programs and our early, like, you know, Mac, whatever, 512K thing. And mm -hmm. we would all learn how to use MIDI together. And, you know, my brother and I would start writing songs, you know, just sit songs or whatever. And my brother would play these chords and I would just come up to the keyboard and just start playing melodies over it. And I didn't know I could really do this, but he would just be like, wow, you're writing these melodies. I'm like, yeah, I kind of am. I was just like, doo -doo 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 -doo. and I was, I guess I have enough, you know, this little affinity to like write these uh, and I, melodies. So it was, that was years before I kind of started being in a rock band. So I guess, you know, it's just, it was just built in. You know, I, I was just lucky enough to born in the situation where I just was constantly surrounded by, you know, a high level of musical uh, expectations that, it just is what it was, you know, I wasn't trying to be like, you know, hey, I'm going to be this overly progressive guy and, you know, I'm going to flex in doing these chords. Mm -hmm. It was just, you know, came to be and, you know, some of my friends would laugh at it. It's like, ooh, jazz chords, you know, this and that. And I'm like, yeah, well, it sounds cool, doesn't it? And they're like, yeah, it does, I guess. And sometimes I'd have to find myself simplifying chords and so forth. But it really just comes down to just the overwhelming knowledge I had of, of certain musics that just name to be progressive-esque chords and f for better or for worse and uh, uh, it just came from that. Don't you um, feel like it's sort of, I mean for me, I, I, don't, I would never say I'm sophisticated in jazz or anything like that but when you're playing around with a, a chord or just you know intervals on guitars it's like some resonate with you, yeah. some don't and right. then some or like, I've heard that before, I don't want to hear that again. I want to do something yeah. that's me. Right, it was, exactly, and that was, I wasn't hearing that sort of arrangement, chordal, you know, writings, and that's why I kind of, why I did it. Um, I was kind of on a mission, I guess, when I started doing guitar-based writings that, you know, I didn't, I'm not hearing people do this sort of progression, so I'll throw it out there, you know, not expecting that it's going to be the right thing, but to test it. You know, the whole 12 Rods experience for me was an experiment. I didn't know how to do anything when that band started. I wasn't a singer, I wasn't a guitarist, I wasn't a front man. So it was just like, this is what I know, I'm going to play it, see if it works. But I knew what I was doing, um, enough to go like, okay, I can make these chords work, but in the whole context of, you know, pop rock culture might not have been accepted or might have been a little heavy handed but it was um, it wasn't theoretically based I never thought of that I was like writing based off theory it was always an, my theory knowledge I always made a concerted effort to use my theory knowledge as a dice you know to dissect music mm. you know if I heard music that I liked you know um, especially during my writing you know learning to write I, I would figure it out and I would either write it down or get a guitar and, and, and figure out what's going on and you know I would it was pretty easy for me to use my ear my, my ear training through Suzuki learning by rote um, to pick out a lot of things and go okay that's what they're doing ah that's ah interesting clever good okay and that's how it was learned um, I never write you know manuscript charts um, never thought I'd have to like, you know, think about the math behind it. Everything was all emotionally based still, you know, I just would write a series of progressions I'm like, man, oh, that works, mm -hmm. you know, and whether or not it was, you know, even if, you know, I, I, I probably lifted a few progressions from, from other songs here and there, um, 
reappropriate them into something completely different, but I knew what I was doing and I knew the theory behind it enough to go like, okay, I can, I can use that tool to, to write if I had to, had to, but I try not to ever like be academically minded when I'm writing anything. It's all just like what I'm kind of feeling still, but you know, I always have that tool in my back pocket of theory. It's always good to know because someone will always play something cool. I'm like, well, what's he doing there? That's really cool, clever little progression or change or modulation. And I'd be thinking about it, you know? And I was just, you know, growing up in my musical, you know, environment, that's just how, what we did anyway, you know? Um, it's just, so I, I applied that to kind of, you know, pop music and, and you know, more street level musics. And, uh, you know, for a while people, I couldn't tell if people were getting it or not. I had a lot of mixed reactions, you know, in, in a lot of the early days. I didn't really care because I was just focused on trying to learn what I was doing, you know. Um, over time, it became a sound, you know. Uh, write your fifth or sixth song. It's like, oh, okay, this is kind of how I write, I guess. Um, but I don't ever try to flex or make people think like, ooh, I'm just, you know, I'm just a jazz musician playing rock. Because, you know, um, I wasn't, even though I probably was. But I, I just, I didn't want that to be thrown off or cast off into the world like that. Um, well, it kind of makes me think about like the shredder musicians back. I mean, it was a little bit before, you know, probably early 80s and mm -hmm. stuff where they would pull out like a Mixolydian scale. Oh yeah, they'd know it. They'd be like very, that. yeah, playing just broke music, you know, but twice as fast. And it's, yeah. it's cool, but it's, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a flex that sometimes is like, oh guys, come on, you know. But back then it made more sense because it was kind of new, you know. It's a, uh, that shredder sound and just flying around the neck and, you know, I, I respect that, you know, but it also wasn't, my, I'm, I'm not a shredder, I, even, even though I'm, I was, could have been considered a prolific musician in, in, in what I was getting into, I just, I never really was into solos, I never liked lead line, or, you know, here's the bridge, solo time, you know, it's just, I never got into or wanted to learn how to shred like that, because I just, well, it was the 90s, you know, the whole, you know, model of, you know, the rock musician was severely changed, yeah. you know, and no more Steve Eyes, now. you know, we're, we're getting to the era of like, you know, um, yeah. and it, it worked for me because I was along that mindset, you know, I was really kind of getting fed up with, you know, the overly produced 80s sound that was just like, it's great, you know, I appreciate it, but it was just like, oh God, this is just getting pretty cheesy at this mm -hmm. point, yeah. you know, and then kind of, you know, the whole... 90s punk kind of just obliterated all that, but I was like right in line with that too. I was like, yes, this is actually great for me, and it's, it allows me to kind of not have to like worry about absolute like technique and practicing, you know, six hours a day of my my guitar. I just I knew how to play chords and I knew how to strum. I was a percussionist, so getting you know rhythms right in my right hand and and, and playing with the rhythm section was came naturally. Um, which made things easier because I was, I was going to school right before that for a percussion performance in Chicago um, as a major. So, you know, the ambidexterity and uh, my limbs were, you know, I, I could, it was easy for me to pick it up. And my Suzuki knowledge and the strings and so forth was, you know, but it wasn't, you know, anything more than just chords and, and ear training and, and, and listening. I wasn't expected to ever play lead lines or was going to write like that. So it was, it was, you know, I didn't think of being chords. You know, I didn't, even though I loved like ACDC, and but I, was, we, I didn't want to be a riff-based band. I wanted to be a chord-based band. You know, and uh, yeah, it just, there was, wasn't too much. You know, besides, besides power chords going on, you know, and, and stuff like that. And occasionally you hear some cool notes here and there, but you know, who knows if they were accidental or not with, with, with some of these songs that I was hearing, because you'd hear a song that had a really great progression, and then the rest of the songs on their particular record of this group would just wouldn't have that. So it's like, was that an accident? I don't know, but it was a good idea still. Maybe I'll, you know, be inspired by it. So I knew things could be done. I knew like, you know, good chords and that good extension note now and again is great. And it has always been there in like pop music. It's just subtly used, you know. You got to know when and when not to, you know, play these notes. Um, otherwise, these things are just too thick, especially when you have a distorted guitar. You're just strumming away and raking these chords and it's just like, you play more than three notes, or it's just, you really can't hear more than those notes, you know, it gets really, so you have to learn to play cleaner, or not play them, or, or put them, give those notes to another instrument to differentiate, because it's, you know, there's, you can get overwhelming and just too thick, so I had to learn that as well, because it was, 
there were times in early practices where I'd you know, play these big chords with a lot of distortion, and the other guys would be like, I have no idea what I'm hearing. <laughs> I can't tell what's going on. And I don't even know what the root note is. It's just like, okay, I get it. Okay, okay. I, you know, I did take those to heart and learn how to, okay, well, if that's what you're hearing, chances are the audience is probably going to get confused by that too. So you learn to pare it down. You learn to kind of like find the time to use it. Um, but I never really based my music off of that sort of technique. It's just what I hear, and, but I'm very aware of it to know when not to do that as well. Um, but, you know, throw it in there at the right time, it's like, oh, God, that was a good, good note, you know, and it pulls those heartstrings just right. Very valid. Um, so, Which uh, leads me to a question about your, you know, initial relationship with production and technology and stuff like that i i can't find the bliss record anywhere i don't does it not exist and what what it what did you learn from making that record and where can i get it for one <laughs> uh well i'm sure it's if you asked around online people do have copies and i'm sure you could make a copy we, you know it'd be nice to kind of reissue that at some point it's, it's a fun little representation of of what I was doing at a very you know, preliminary stages of writing, but it was... But well, you produced that too, right? Well, I, mean, or I, did... I guess. I mean, I, I wrote and kind of, I guess it was, I mean, technically, and it was produced by Ev in, the ses, in, this, in, the, okay. in, in a way that he was up in Minneapolis. Okay, I went to college and I moved back from college um, to my hometown um, after a, like a semester or two because I, you know, I had, I was influenced and kind of reinvigorated to do 12 rods seriously. And because that started right before I went to college and then I had to go to college so I had to quit the band. But it was just, after our first show, one show that we did, I would kind of uh, had a band, but I didn't want a band. So I went back home after college, you know, a semester. And um, Ev at that point graduated from college and moved up here to work um, at various studios. And he was working at a Metro, um, which was downtown at the time. And he had access to a studio. Um, we got a really good discounted rate. So we came up here, um, went downtown, and stayed with my brother for like a weekend or so, and uh, recorded the, the Bliss tape um, up here. Um, and he, you know, with Ev's knowledge, I didn't, know, I, I didn't know studios at all at that point. So Ev just kind of manned the board and kind of directed the whole situation. But, you know, musically, I was pretty much on top of like, Assigning parts, writing parts, you know, doing the arrangements. Um, but as far as mixing and, you know, all the other uh, uh, logistical jobs that had to be done were done by Ev, because he went to um, a Peabody Conservatory of Music in Baltimore, which is, you know, part of Johns Hopkins, and he got his degree in audio engineering. Mm -hmm. um, so I learned everything from him. So it didn't take long. Um, through that session and after that, um, I just learned everything from him. Um, and then decided that I would eventually just kind of take that role over, um, I guess, within like the second or third record. He, he would mainly be the engineer, but it, it was hard to say who was really producing the record. We all kind of like had a hand, and we all knew what we were doing at that point. So they got like, okay, we, we know the process, we know how to get through the, through the whole, you know, uh, scope of how to start at, from A to, A to Z and just go through it. And, but it was, my hand was held by Ev, of course. He would give me all this great information and all these tips and this and that. And, you know, I, I just figured it would be the cheapest thing to do is if I just learned to do everything myself. You know, we didn't have a lot of money, so and things were expensive back then, you know. DAWs didn't really exist. And, you know, recording your own, yourself was, it was uh, a pretty... Uh, confounding thing to do, and period. It was so, but I figured it was the only thing to do <laughs> for me. And if I would have wanted to write songs and, you know, portray them as a complete finished product, I just had to figure it out. And I just went through the uh, process of, of, of learning, you know, four tracks really well um, into, you know, going up. And all of a sudden, you know, Dawes come around and Evan, he was so in the digital mindset of like the future of what's to come in the early 90s that you know we jumped on that d digital train pretty quickly and uh he uh, i learned all that and uh so 
I was lucky to have an older brother who, so my, my, my education in, in, in the tech field of it all comes from my brother's education at Peabody. And what he learned at Peabody was, you know, kind of interesting because it was based off a, a whole old school curriculum, you know, tape, splicing tape, and so forth. And as soon as he graduated, it's like, you know, not only is digital coming around, but, you know, the whole alt grunge movement is here. And it's like, my brother's listening to like, you know, my buddy Valentine records and thinking to himself, wow, everything I learned doesn't really matter. <laughs> you know, he straight up admitted, I remember we were on a plane and I, I was giving him some records I was into and he's like getting into them and he's like, man, this applies to nothing that I learned in college. And so he had to kind of relearn a whole new set of uh, you know, techniques as well to kind of accommodate, well, the modern, you know, state of music and, tech and uh, uh, studio recording. So we kind of learned that together. We just figured it out by just, you know, we're pretty aware and observant of what was coming, what was to come and how people were doing it. And we just were very observant um, and took in a lot of notes and, okay, if they can do that, we can do that sort of, sort of mentality. And uh, we learned very quickly and we just kind of had this nice little hybrid of like, a very advanced skill set of, of, of academics and, you know, and this very pop sort of posts uh, uh, concepts of what we were to do and wanted to do with 12 Rods. Um, so I learned through him. Eventually, Ev, you know, of course, quits and kind of doesn't, pretty much quits music. He was so burnt out with music that he just, you know, I just took over um, the production stuff. And with that, I just, you know, Lost Time was pretty much the first record I did myself um, from beginning to end. Um, Ev just kind of like threw his hands up and was just, just do it, you know. I'm like, okay, I'll do it. I really wanted to do it. I had the ideas. Um, I was, my ear was, was de getting so detailed at that point where I was, my editing skills were just really refined and more so than my, you know, than Ev was hearing. I was hearing pitch issues and, you know, uh, counterpoint issues that, my brother wasn't really hearing that I was like, Ev, we gotta fix this. He's like, you're hearing what? I'm like, Ev, he's just, can I do this for a bit? <laughs> yeah. And uh, he's like, cool, cool, just do what you need to do. And uh, I just, and it was out of just what I heard. I wasn't out of it, you know, it wasn't an ego thing. It wasn't that I wasn't gonna take over. It was just like the things that had to get done weren't getting done and I, I, I identified them and had to take care of it. And at that point, I just, I knew enough to like squeak by and get all the production stuff done by myself, and then I learned how to mix, and learned how to master. I wasn't great at it, but um, it took a long time until I like, really figured out math, or mixing and mastering. And, and honestly, it was not until like, okay, time passes, I'm up here. I have a, a, I got a new studio since like say 10 years ago, um, 15 years ago. And uh, I got a new set of speakers, and some Genlex, and, and I swear to you, it took me seven years until I, learn the speakers and learn how to mix. I'm like, oh, I get it. And I know how to mix now. I, I finally understand what's going on. And you know, all, all the tools that were starting to come out of the whole, you know, digital evolution, you know, the whole simulation, emulation, sort of tools that were, you know, through plugins were getting advanced, which didn't exist in the early days of, days of digital, which made it sound really bad. Um, you know, I get to learn about these pieces of equipment, the LA-2A and, you know, certain synthesizers and work with them in this emulated state where like, I get why these are classic instruments. I don't have to spend you know, thousands and thousands of dollars buying them to figure it out. So I take that very seriously. So I got, you know, very classic, very reputable, you know, plugins that are emulated, very, you know, uh, renowned instruments. And I made an effort to learn how that worked and why, why are professionals using these? And granted, it's not the real thing. It's close enough for me to understand the operation values. So I, um, once I you know, started figuring out what these compressors were used for and why they're used for, you know, it's like, oh, that's why this is the sound. That's why this compressor is used for drums. Well, this is right for that. And you know, that went through, I went through that process. And then I realized, you know, I, I got it. There's a certain point, maybe within the past eight, nine years, I felt like I understood exactly how to mix. And I was able to hear anything and go, this is what you need to do to fix it. And I just, but it was all a necessity based out of my poverty still. 
uh, I didn't have any money, so uh, you know, plugins were free, you know, for the most part, or, or I could, ha you know, at the time you could crack things, and um, tons of, sorry to say, but we had crack stuff, and we had to learn through that. And you know, at a certain time, you're like, you know, we can't use these cracked instruments. Um, moral, ethical issues slash. Um, there's, it's impossible to like upgrade your OS if you have these cracked instruments. And once you upgrade things, things get erased and your computer pretty much just gets screwed. Um, so you have to start buying stuff, but, um, but still it's a fraction of the cost of what the real thing is. And, but they still worked. You know, now, you know, through like UAD and Waves and other companies, it's just, they got it down so well that, you know, Anymore, you can pick up an iPad, and GarageBand is literally a $2 million studio that you have to pay, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to work in for, for weeks, and it's, people don't really fully, you know, in this certain latter generations, you know, millennials and whatever, I mean, not to say they don't know, but they don't understand what a lot of these instruments that they have are doing, or understand how important or how valued they are, you know, so I've got to plug it up this and this, but no, that's... A, that's huge for this, and that's really, and it works in these free softwares enough to be like, you know, it's, it's a really interesting state. It's, uh, it's just kind of, kind of a, a mind screw that you're, wow, you know, this is really free anymore. And it, everyone gets that concept of, oh, now we can all be bedroom producers now. And music starts to go downhill because everyone's a bedroom producer because you can, you know, and I was just lucky enough to be on that threshold between the two eras of like, no, I was taught by my dad to how to splice tape. I, I worked and learned how to w operate reel-to-reels by my dad, you know. I had to, my first four track was my mom's four track. <laughs> and you know, my brother taught me how to use it, you know. It was just the kind of family it was. So I got that privilege to learn just enough information to like learn how hard and real that is and then, you know, enter this new world of digital to uh, apply it appropriately without taking anything for granted. Um, so every little plugin I get anymore, I'm just reading it and learning it from beginning to end. You know, I love manuals. I love, you know, I, 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 you know, I'll, every piece of gear I get, I will dig deep and learn it so hard that it becomes like to the point where I'm, I'm modifying these pieces of these instruments anymore through circuit bending or just whatever casual mods I'm throwing in there because that's just how I learned to operate. I learned to respect these instruments so much that I learn them, realize what they can't do, and if I can change that, I will actually modify it myself. My dad's a tinker. I learned to tinker through him, you know, as well. He's, he loved ham radios. He had all this stuff, and he loved opening things up. And, and same with my brother. So it was just one of those, I just grew up in that family. We were both very tech-minded and both very, very musically-minded. So that helped me just kind of develop into a, a producer state of mind. Um, so it's, it kind of comes from that. And I got lucky enough to kind of, like, be able to uh, uh, continue these, uh, that train of thought through 12 Rods and then because that band kind of somewhat took off and gave me the opportunity to hone those skills and even after that, when that died, I, l I just took my tinkering aspects of what I learned and, you know, turned that to like circuit bending and, you know, learning that whole philosophy of, of, uh, of I guess, I guess it's more of a concept of how one can Ra you know, control their own instruments without feeling overwhelmed by their instruments. Um, and that, that's a whole other subject, but um, I just took it very seriously, you know, and I, I try not to take anything that's a musical instrument or, or, or tech-based situation for, for granted and just say, oh, I don't know what's going on here. I'm just going to let someone else do it. It's like, no, I, run, I walk into a room, I'm like searching everything and, you know, I'm learning every piece of gear and messing with it and not out of just like random curiosity. Curiosity is just like something I have to do at this, with this career. Um, and it saved me tens of thousands of dollars um, doing that. I, I mean, it's, it's, it just came out of a necessity-based situation. With a lucky, luckily I had an advantage of being in that family situation that was able to um, uh, nurture it and, uh, and then so forth, so. Oh, it shows, I mean. The, those records, I mean, even like, I mean, not even, but I mean, even I was listening to Gay the other day, and, the, and one thing I was, will say is like, it's not so much that every track is like, 
perfectly clear or anything like that or any, but every track has an int- is interesting mm-hmm. like you know what i mean like it's like there's a, there's life to each piece of what you put on tape and i think that really says a lot about you as an artist thank you um yeah that's that's luck that's just the hardware i was given i, I personally i don't know how or why exactly i was my, 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 the rest of my family aren't say like writers. They're arrangers and and uh, and so forth. But none of them really write, you know, uh, original musics. And I never thought myself that I would be, or necessarily even wanted to be. But because of Twelve Rods and that whole uh, entrance into why that band was made, which was not my idea, I was just thrown into a situation where I, I had to be, you know, I uh, I just had the ability to do it and I just I love music so much that and I as a kid you know before even 12 rods I was thinking about you know one four fives and you know two five ones and uh, and all the progressions that and and, and why and I just it's hard to say I mean I, I, it, it kind of confuses me like why I got the the bug to want to write um, I just felt it, and I don't think it, I think that ability transcends everything I've even talked about so far. It's just you either have it or you don't, I guess. Um, I'm not saying it's like Ooh, I'm special or anything like that. It's just you know I was the only one in the crews who who was who could write. You know, no one knew where to start or how to or understand how to get from the beginning to an end of a song and have a flow that you know makes sense. A lot of which I learned from my father, I guess. You know when he was arranging, and I told him at one point I wanted to be a songwriter, I guess. He was like, okay, well, you gotta learn, know a few things. He tells me you gotta do this and that. He wasn't a songwriter, but he, of course he it was an educator, knew how songs worked. So, you know, I listened to my dad, if, you know, and I just kind of like, okay, I get, I get what you're saying, and, you know, I just use these philosophies to write songs, and it's just... I, so what, were, are, what are some of those philosophies? What, um, what did he tell you? Well. One chord must always just lead to the next, you know. Um, counterpoint was, you know, certain sustaining notes have to like, you know, be notes that are relevant notes between the chords and the an- anticipatory values of using those notes at the right time to lead up to this, the chord that comes after it. And that the spacing between notes, I mean, my dad taught me how to swing. My dad, at a very young age, my dad, before my, I get a snare drum, even. My dad said, no, you're not learning anything behind the drums until you learn how to use your right hand on the ride cymbal and your left hand on the hi-hat. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> um, and, you know, with that, I, I started dissecting those issues and going, okay, well, every note and beat matters before and after. If this note is played early, it's going to affect the beat two beats down on where that just felt, you know, and mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's a strange algorithm that's like well tempered, it's like something that more so is like, you know, it's a it's 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 not calculatable on like equal divisions. You know, the concepts of swing and grooves and and feel are are, are human conditions that can be tracked and mapped, but only really realized when you feel it. And that was taught to me um, by my father. And you know, when you're seven or eight years old being hit with these, you know, big philosophies, it's, you know, whether or not you fully understand them, then they, 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 they do sink in. And um, he's an educator too, so of course he's really good at explaining to me, you know, how music works. Um, mm. You know, it's just, and he's a great educator. He's super entertaining and very articulate. Mm. And I just, I got really lucky. You know, I was born into a really interesting family that, you know, without a, a shadow of a doubt, as soon as I was like three years old, I knew I was going to be a musician the rest of my life. Mm. And we, my, same as my brother, it's just like that was the path. And, you know, it's not, it doesn't stray far from the, the showbiz parents that go like, you know, throwing their kids on stage or anything like that. It, but it was a little more healthy. <laughs> I was definitely like living in the shadow and also being the predecessor of, you know, a musical family. They wanted to be musicians and be like them and kind of live, live a continuation of their legacy, you know. It had, I don't want to say unhealthy attributes, but, you know, whether we knew it or not, music was forced upon us. <laughs> and, it, you know, we didn't deny it or, or didn't uh, 
avoid um, not being musicians. We were just happily accepted, like, yeah, this is the ultimate. It was great, and we were all kind of good at it, so it, why not? It was just, we knew it from the get-go. And having that advantage of knowing at such a young age that you're going to be a musician, you just accept way more values. Um, you're not confused by what you want to do with your life. You just, you just know that you just have to learn everything that's thrown at you musically. And in fact, you got to, you know, learn how to articulate to those that you're playing with. And you end up being like, you know, just thrown into the position of being a musical director or, or you're the, the lead of the section and an and, and, and orchestra or, 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 or bands and, and so forth. And, and it was just natural, you know, through my mom's and dad's influence, you know. Um, and I think I, I also just got lucky by learning how to, or just teaching myself how to write songs and having that natural inclination that's just my own sole desire to write music. You know, I'd see and hear bands and, and musicians play and do their very original musics um, that were like, would blow me away. And I just had really nothing to do with the academics of it all. And I was, I was you know, I was always thinking, hey, if they can do it like that, I can do it like that. You know, it didn't look hard. You know, I just had to try it and apply myself. And I the time just came and I just, uh, you know, seize the moment, I guess, at a certain right time to be able to, you know, you know. I, when, when the whole, you know, 90s came around, it was like anything was possible, you know. You were hearing the weirdest bands um, on the radio and on TV that were just, weren't pop bands necessarily. They were, you know, every band was getting successful and they were just, you know, doing weird stuff. And I'm like, wow, this is perfect. I can really get away with what I'm doing because as long as I'm completing an idea and presenting it, that's all you need to do. You know, it doesn't necessarily even have to fall into a category of like, you know, sound. You know, there's just a vast array of what was going on, you know, between guitar sounds and musical sounds to like arrangements and, you know, levels of energy thrown off. It's just, it was, it was, you know, just, it was the right time for me to take, you know, I can take my original idea as maybe immature as it was and overly mature in some ways that I could just, it was enough for me to go, let's just, it's perfect, I can do it, let's go, and I'll, I'll learn, learn along the way the rest of the stuff I need to figure out because I had to learn music all my life, you know, how hard could this be? All you have to do is keep a band together and, you know, follow up with, you know, doing all the logistics of booking shows and, and being a band. Um, and it was just fun because we're my best friends were all you know musicians too and skaters as well so it was it was kind of perfect. Oxford, my hometown, had a really strange uh, kind of plethora of really interesting, colorful musicians and people from this really home, really strange hometown of mine that was in the middle of cornfields, and you know it was we were a bunch of weird kids, um, and they helped facilitate the whole the whole ride, and it was. So, I don't know, songwriting, just, it came from within. I mean, I, there was nothing my parents really could have taught me, or anyone could have taught me, really, except basic environmental, you know, listenings that I was a songwriter, and going to be a songwriter. I just knew I could do it, and I just forced myself to do it. And then I learned how to do it off command, kind of by, from the get-go, you know. Do this. So my friend's like, hey, you got to do this. Or how about, I got this, you know, uh, opportunity to, like, do a show. Want to do something? I'm like okay, who's going to spearhead this whole thing? And I'm like, I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, oh, okay, I guess I got to do it. <laughs> it happens all the time, even to this day. Every project I've been in has been one of those uh, assigned situations. I mean, seriously, name mm. it. Mystery Palace, Pitch, C. Costra, um, even this the two new 12 Rod stuff. It's all based off someone else's idea that just has, right, you should do this. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and that's how, you know, I, I'm, it's a problem solving. I, I just became really good at problem solving and how to figure out what you had to do in order to complete a project. Mm -hmm. And through countless you know, uh, you know, situations like that, you just learn how to do it all. And you realize what needs to be done, um, whatever it may be. Um, and so getting into like, the weirder stuff when it comes to like Mystery Palace and Pitch Records and C. Costra, you know, that's, those were just like very advanced uh, processes that I concocted based off just trying to one up myself, but also stuff I was really hearing, it, it, you know, and that's when my real pr production skills kind of like, it, you know, advanced, um, where I felt like I was really doing what I wanted to do 
and at a, at a level and a sound that was way different than what was going on. But yet I felt it was very valid and needed. I mean, I had to work at the Kitty Cat Club. I saw, you know, for 17 years, I'd saw, I've seen every band numerous times. And, you know, I knew exactly what was going on in this town. I knew exactly what wasn't going on in this town. I'm like, and there came a point, honestly, I remember, the, you know, Kitty Cat was like, you know, watching this band and all of a sudden I was like, I know what's missing. We, this is what this town needs, you know, or I thought this was what this town needs. I'm like, okay, see Costra stuff, you know, or whatever it was at the time. I was just, it was all based off, I felt like the community is missing this. I think they get really appreciate this sort of thing. And it was kind of based off that, off someone else's idea. If they were like, hey, we're going to do this. I'm like, you know, delve into it, think about it. And it hit me. I remember one day at the Kitty Cat Club, I was like watching bands. I'm like, oh. I understand. I don't remember, don't remember what exactly what it was, but it was a picture show. Was, okay, I know what I have to do now because I guess no one else is going to do it. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like one of those, you know, I've learned how to be the guy that digs up and or, uh, you know, um, I don't see what I'm looking for. Just uh, I'm sorry, picking up and, and adopting the ideas that were left behind or not, not, not mm-hmm. developed. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, people may say, oh, it's all been done before, but I was just like, no, this whole subsection of b- these, two er- these two groups, there's this whole area right in here that wasn't developed. So what was that? What did we well, ta- tape manipulation. I mean, okay. what I was with Pitch Records, what I was doing with, 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 with Mystery Palace and the circuit bending and, and putting that into musical territories of, of pop, what I was attempting to do, you know, taking these abstract instruments that were spitting out garbage, essentially, that, and learning how to pare that down in ways through modifications to make it usable in a musical situation because most of those instruments were just used for noise and, like, you know, textural, um, experimental uh, situations, and it, it, which is cool. But nobody was taking that into, you know, harmonic, melodic territories of, of, of songwriting that I could hear. I searched and there was like nothing going on. I'm like, well, okay, here's something I could, here's, here's a nice challenge. Um, and then, you know, but that happened, you know, after I got into circuit bending and started like playing at noise shows. And then a musical friend said, hey, you should, we should start jamming together. What's up, what you're doing? And, you know, we got together. They were like, you should start out of nowhere after we were jamming. Like, you should, we should really start a band, like actually start writing again, like I used to in 12 Rod, doing this stuff. And I'm like, whoa, okay, that'd be pretty cool. And that was a, that's another assignment where I was like, okay, well, that's a great idea. I'll attempt it. And, you know, it's, a, it's a, the process of building an instrument, or find, finding an instrument that wasn't used before, devoting yourself to this particular instrument. Mine was, in Mystery Palace, the Yamaha PSS 470. And it's just a little keyboard that, that was at the time worth $30. And I knew that this thing was circuit bendable, but no one was doing it. And I was learning how to circuit bend into more professional gears that no one was, like, like uh, effects pedals that were, you know, gu- you know, gu- guitar effects pedals to pro pieces of equipment, rack mounts, um, pro pe- proer pieces of uh, keyboards and synthesizers that I was identifying as being. These are actually the same technologies inside, just more of it, of instruments that other people have bent with other small, like Furbies or, or speaking spells and things like that. Mm-hmm. Like, looking at these chips on the inside, like, you know, this is the same sort of, you know, uh, circuit board that's, you know, it's just a lot more of chips. <laughs> okay. So, but no one was taking these, you know, instruments that were costing hundreds of dollars and like feeling comfortable with opening them up and like really like rerouting all the, you know, the, the data points and all the, vol- you know, the voltages and capacitance and this and that. And I just figured, you know what? I'm going to risk it and, and, and try this. And I had a lot of success doing that. And with that, gave me these instruments that could be could still played musically, you know, the keyboards, could, but they had all these glitch opportunities for me to like be able to do polyrhythmic, you know, um, and melodic, you know, uh, extension, atonalities that were kind of just badass, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and I was able to just bring it up a notch to, to like, okay, well, let's make it, Let's pare down these, this noise and, and let me find all the harmonics that apply to a certain tonic and, you know, make these sequences somehow with the switches to create the foundation of a song, you know, with a rhythm section. And, uh, 
you know, stuff like that. Nobody was doing that. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to hear that. I was like, I was, you know, going, getting into this. I kind of expected, you know, this to be done. You know, I was searching the internet, trying to find bands that were doing anything. And it was like, it just didn't exist. Um, you know, stuff like that. Seacost, yeah. you know, and Pitch Records comes around, you know. The level I was taking the tape manipulation stuff, people were doing kind of what I was doing, but with plugins, you know. Mm-hmm. Their, their tape degrader plugin or their, you know, stuff like that. You know, that was, I thought that was, you know, cool, but at the same time kind of, you know, why don't you just use a real thing? Modify the instrument, have it kind of glitch out and so forth. It had became this four track that I, that I made that became the definitive pitch sound, which has like a couple switches on it, which create a, a certain warbling effect based off draining the power of the motor. But when a velocity would hit the tape, off or on the tape, it would drain the power. So like if a kick drum would come in and the tape would go, Doo-doo-doo. You know, so, it, so it, would, it would cause these pitch modulations that would be rhythmic. Mm. It kind of like side chain, mm. but it was mm. totally organic, analog, you know, circuitry based stuff that I was rigging up. And which became that every single record and song that through pitch records has to be processed through this particular modified four track. Mm. No one else was really doing that, you know, and taking that seriously, turned those into act, you know, actual songs and following this exact process that you have to be very uh, militant over. You have mm. to have this very strict discipline that you know you could easily be distracted by something else. I mean, because I'm a gear person by default. I don't like to say that I am, but you know, I like I, mean, I'm, I like gear a lot. But I like you know the weird stuff that no one that's really cheap and no one's or that people are like ignoring. Mm. And you find this stuff for cheap online before they go back up in price years later, and not only just obtain them but modify them mm-hmm. before people even can even like, get a whiff that they're even cool again. So mm-hmm. I get this advantage of being able to, you know, find these instruments. And I have walls and walls and walls of, of instruments that people have taken for granted mm-hmm. that not only do I have them, I mean, I've learned them, but I've modified them. Um, and I just I went with that. I, I found that early on in, in, in the game of pitch to be able to take that idea and run mm-hmm. because you know, I, I wanted to hear it. I was, I would, be, I wasn't. It was a competition. I, I didn't want to be, be the first one to do it. I just knew I had to, someone had to do it, whether it was going to be good or not, or you know, be a, a successful endeavor was relative. It didn't really matter. It was just someone had to do it to prove to the world that it could or couldn't be done. <laughs> you know, and if it, did, if it was like one of those things, you know, at least I tried and showed the world that you know what, at least we all know now that you can't do this. You know. Yeah. I, I, was, I was prepared for that outcome, but you know, it turned into something and every, I was getting results. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, it's trial and error, but I had to be very disciplined. You know, I, with the circuit bending, I had to like buy tons of keyboards and bend them and then figure out which keyboard I'm going to focus on, you know, and realize that all these other keyboards I made are going to be used 10 years later and accept that. Otherwise, I'd never stay focused. So that discipline, I realized, had to be really intact. Um, so I spent six or so years around learning the heck out of the PSS 470 that I modified. And I had two of them, and that was just a mystery palace out. Every record, every song was just two PSS 470s, bass and drums. Okay. That's it. And no one else was doing anything like that, but someone had to prove that concept with my instruments or just with any instrument, you know? find something no one else has, learn the hell out of it, and then make, and make a product out of it. Um, mm. Not just tinker with it, play with it, and kind of learn it, but show results mm. with it. Mm. And prove the world that something like this can be done. Not with this, this keyboards, but the philosophy mm. of, you don't have to just play the guitar that everyone's playing, and play, have, that, have that same model of band that you think you have to have. Um, it's relative to I mean, to a lot of other issues. I just, I just had that advantage of being able to seek those out, which was also another money-saving thing. You know, mm-hmm. who needs a keyboard that costs, you know, $2,500 when you could have just as many results with a $30 keyboard? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And that's strictly a musical situation. You know, you have to know how to use it. You know, it just, and it proves to the world that, you know what, it doesn't matter what gear you're piece of. You can pick up a set of spoons and be cool with it if you really knew how to touch the spoons. Mm-hmm. Um, 
not that I like spoons or anything, but <laughs> spoons speaking, are cool, sure. But. Speaking of, well, one of the things that I've been trying to do with this series a little bit, sort of selfishly, just because you know, I deal with a lot of bands that are, you know, I guess you could call them up and coming or trying to make something work or, you know, playing around in their rehearsal spaces and stuff is something that I call band dynamic. And I have a lot of bands that will say, well, we just can't find a bass player or we just can't do that or we can't, you know, our drummer's, you know, always late or something like that. Mm -hmm. I noticed you, you're throughout the years of 12 Rods, you've gone through a, a bunch of bass players. Mm -hmm. And, but what I've always said, my, my band's similar in that we just, we've had five bass players over the course of 10 years. I feel like there's, there's like a core dynamic that happens with almost every band. Mm. And it felt like at the beginning, you're, you was sort of like you and Ev. Like that was your dynamic. Mm. Sort of whatever happened around you mm. was like yeah. superfluous to you and Ev. Mm. Would, do, you, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, it was simply because Evan and I obtained the most knowledge. We have the most education, and Ev wasn't originally in the group, but we wanted him to group to kind of take charge of the more technical aspects of the group. None of us do it yet, but um, it just was what it was. I tried to give a lot of people the other opportunity to, you know, work. Um, unfortunately, even though. Hmm, they were into what the sound was and the band. Most of them didn't have a lot of ability to write parts. And if I were to sh write a song, and, and I had to be sensitive to this, I didn't want to ever like, tell anyone directly what to play um, because you know, I, I'm still kind of open to the, you know, their ideas. But I mean, just out of what it was and the people we just so happened to have, most of them had to be taught the parts but the parts had to be like well formed it wasn't me just going oh play my part i'm like i'd be like i'd, I'd hear their part out if they had a part and I'm like okay hear my part out this is what you know how i think it should be played you know 100 percent of the time literally 100 percent of the time they'd be like that's the part i'd happily play that you know i got lucky like that I'd, i would just end up writing the parts and bass is not i don't want to say it's you know it's of course this is going to sound bad but for me, it wasn't a very hard instrument to play. And I just had, it was very easy. And it, in order to me to write songs, I had to think of the bass notes. You know, it was very natural for me to like figure out how the counterpoint worked based off what the bass was doing. So it was written very naturally with my songs, you know, um, and so forth. I mean, a lot of Did you play the bass on a lot of those records? Um, Cause uh, the maybe a little bit two? here and there, but it was, you know, I, not too many. When oh, okay. The last record that's coming out, yeah, I, I played the bass, I play everything, but the bass parts were written by me, pretty much every record, but played by someone else. Okay. Um, because they were, you know, technically better bass players, but, you know, the parts, they weren't writing parts, they were just happy to, luckily happy to play the parts that I wrote for them. And um, the bass players, of course, you know, feel slighted over time, and when it comes time to, like, register your songs and deal with all the and mechanicals of, of songs, you know, you realize that, you know, you know the bass players didn't really write too much, but you, you have to like keep a band, you know, you got to share the love and toss bit, band members a bone just to like out of a good faith measurement. Yeah. And uh, I wasn't doing that out of, you know, strictly out of a, like a sympathy issue or anything like that, but it was. No, I, when I was listening to those records over the last week, I, I, the bass kept his, hitting me, and I'm like, who's playing the bass? Like, I, I didn't, because I looked through your Wikipedia, and I was like, I don't know if some of these people actually played on these records or whether you have, a lot but I'm like, it was very, the bass was very, it stood out to me a lot, and it, like, really critical to the songs. Yes, I mean, it, it's uh, rhythmically, and, you know, as the tonic note, it's, it's super important, I mean, from the get-go, I would write the guitar and bass parts pretty much simultaneously. Um, because when I was playing the guitar, you know, based off my harmonic knowledge, the bass note wasn't necessarily in the chord that I was playing on guitar, so I'd have to like write this counterpoint to, to uh, represent the song that I had in mind. Um, and with that, you know, 
you know, I guess I, I, I was enough of a bass player from the fact that in junior high, when jazz band came around um, <laughs> for the first year, was it sixth or seventh grade, there was just too many, everybody was a drummer. No one played the bass. And I was assigned because, well, they just thought I could. Hey, Ryan, how about you learn how to play this, the stand-up bass and play jazz? I'm like, okay. So mm-hmm. you play the bass and, of course, learn how to, you know, play the bass and learn how that's, and it, you know, that, that jazz band training was, made it very easy for me to learn bass even better. But it's, bass was such a, a fundamental instrument that I could not learn how to play it, especially as a songwriter. Um, um, so with that said, I, I wrote parts that were very, very realized. And um, if they were realized well enough, um, I knew that the, who was going to play them would have no problem playing it, as long as I'd also write within the style that they were good at playing. You know, certain bass players play a certain way and whatever, and I'd have to go, okay, if they play like that, and they're comfortable playing like that, I'll write a, I'll write a part that accommodates that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that was even with all the drummers. Um, I'd write parts with who, a lot of the time, influenced by who was in the group and how they played, so they would feel natural playing it. So, you know, bass parts were written strictly out of a mindset that X is going to be playing this in the future. So, mm-hmm. and I want to make them feel comfortable playing it. So, okay, that's how they play it. They do a lot of this. And I'm like, okay. So there was a lot of that going on. And a lot of touring bass, we had a lot of touring bass players. And by, by default, they would have to learn parts. And that's where a majority of our bass players kind of came from, was for the touring part of it. Um, and when you have that sort of like uh, necessity uh, based sort of situation, you know, they're just there to, you know, be the side man and learn the part anyway. So, um, and yeah, I, we overturned quite a bit of bass players, but and a lot of them were just, you know, it was, it was personal issues where I left. A lot of them just didn't have time or they had other gigs, you know. It was, became a thing where it was, you know, it was, as long as the members who came into the group really liked the music and appreciated what we were doing, for the most part, they never had a problem with playing whatever part was written. You know, they just liked the song and they were happy to play it. So, you know, I'd always make sure the songs were good. So it's a song they could enjoy. It wasn't just their feeling, okay, I'm just getting paid to play this part. They were getting into it, you know. Yeah. So yeah. that always had to up my ante and like how I had to write, you know. I got to impress my band. In order to, to, to keep a band that's, uh, that's, of a band that's written, the, the content's written by me, I had to, make, you know, accommodate their comfort levels by a lot of that, a lot of making them feel as though they wrote the song, you know, even though they didn't, you know, and they make, they'll play it, you know, over time, and that, that was kind of where I hit some brick walls, you know, um, you make a, a member feel so comfortable playing this, a part that I wrote that they think they wrote it themselves over time, <laughs> and then it's like, oh, I wrote that part, or I deserve more of a cut of this song, I'm like, you know, and you're like, in order to keep them in the group, you got to be like, okay, maybe you did write it, you know. If this is my base, mm-hmm. and it's like, okay, here's X money. <laughs> mm-hmm. But you know, you got to do that in order to keep a band together. You know, it's it's a lot of psychology and a lot of like, I don't want to say manipulation, but it's in a positive way. You got to like, you know, you got to treat them right, even though you're might be short, shorting your sliding yourself a little bit. You know, I lost a lot of money in, in publishing royalties because I had to keep a band together. You know, I'm, I wrote everything, and all the money was supposed to go to me, but I split it evenly amongst the entire group because mm-hmm. you got to do that. And with that goes, you know, a lot of uh, uh, social problems within the group, a lot of communication issues, and, uh, and, and del- delusional situations that were hard to deal with. Um, so it's a double-edged, or not a double-edged sword. It's, it, there's a sword there yeah. <laughs> that can cut you yeah. if you, uh, you know try to, you know, facilitate a situation that, well, backfires in, in my face sometimes. Um, but you got to accept it as part of the game, you know. People are people and, you know, they deserve time or money for their time, or, you know. Yeah. You know, I got to, you know, just accept that, of course, and, you know. So there was a, a lot of that going on. That's such a great point. I mean, just, uh, and I was just thinking about how, you know, there's the business, there's how to keep a band together business wise but then there's how to keep a band creatively together like mm-hmm. where you're you're inspiring each other and and every time you get on stage you you want to play those songs because mm-hmm. they're exciting yeah and so it's you know i mean yeah you got to write around whoever you're playing with i mean or, or 
rearrange a song based off their abilities. So that'll create your sound, but you know, it'll also, if I have just enough control over it still, it's gonna represent the song as it should. But you really have to be sensitive to who you're playing with. You just can't give them every part, you know. Every part based off who's in the group has to be, you know, modified and, and accommodated to that situation. It's just, uh, you know, I learned that at a very early time and it was, it's, you know, trying to balance that out, you know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, slightly manipulative, you know, at, at times, you know, you gotta really make someone else think a certain way that you wanna think. And, and it's just by going by, it goes by, you gotta make them happy. You gotta make them feel comfortable. And by doing so, you just, you know, gotta create that ideal space for them that they wanna be in. And, uh, you know, that's, and you can still write and represent a song, just the same. You just gotta know how your, your members play. And uh, that's kind of, um, as a songwriter, you know, it's what you gotta, it's just, that, that's just the, uh, um, well, the compensation of, 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 of them facilitating your song. You know, they, 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 and you gotta let them do their thing too. Yeah. You really have to, and it's, yeah. Yeah, speaking of folks doing their own thing, you've had two of some of the mo greatest drummers in your band. I mean, Christopher McGuire and Dave King. I mean, Christopher McGuire probably doesn't, people, a lot of people don't know him except for 12 Rods, but I mean, people in this town know him yeah. as just an amazing talent. Yeah, he's, he's very unique and, and legend, legendary. I mean, he, yeah, he has this incredible amount of it energy um and snap to his to his limbs that's a uh, uh preternaturally sort of advanced and at a very young age i remember in junior high he was like a year or two younger than me but yeah he he was i was a drummer too and i wasn't a bad drummer at all but man he could do things i could not do and uh you know that's why i had to pick up guitar you know i wasn't you know it was in these bands that we were assigned to do back in early on he, he I let him have the drum spot because he could fulfill that more aggressively and he didn't want to play any other instrument. I was like, I had the ability to just play other things and I had to like resign drums. And that's how, when I stopped playing just because, you know, Christopher was taking care of it. And, uh, but yes, it was, he's very unique. And I mean, it was, I feel very lucky to have grown up in a very small town that just so happened to have someone like him to be my best friend and my skate buddy and drumming pal and, you know, musical comrade to be with, you know, it's, it's just, and same with Dave King, you know, and the funny thing about Dave King is that I didn't really even ask him to be in the band. He, he forced himself to be in the band. Oh. I was asking him for a number for someone else I wanted. He, he taught a student um, who I was actually wanting to be in the band post Christopher. And he's like, no, I'm going to be in the band. And, oh. and he refused to give like the dudes, you know, my number to this dude. Wow. And I was like, I was almost getting pissed off about it until he was like, dude, I'll do the job. I'll do it. Just let me do it. I'm like, um, okay. I didn't really envision Dave King's style to, to work, but he was so adamant and so upfront and so just aggressive about it <laughs> that we had to give it a shot. And, you know, that was what it was. I mean, he's a great player. I don't know if it was a perfect, I mean, there's two sides of it. I mean, some people love Dave King's playing. Some people just don't, don't agree with it for the, in the context of 12 Rods. I didn't know what I felt. I just knew that he was so willing to do it and he would just, he would make it work that it, it could, it, it, it'll work. He has a certain shoe size that would fill Christopher's and would do other things. He and Christopher are very kind of, very different drummers, you know, in, in mindset and just their philosophies of the world are very different. Um, but it was a radical thing. And, you know, I had to at least accept the radical nature of Dave to be a part of 12 Rods. And there would, cause though that was a thing too, you know, Christopher was a very flamboyant, very, uh, just a socially, you know, just aggressive guy. And so was Dave in a way, but different drummers. So it was, it worked, you know, as a philosophy and as a concept. Musically, it was different, um, did different things. Um, but that's what we had at the time, and it was, it was, it was, it was the first issue, and he, 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 he kind of butted himself into the group, and, and it was, that's fine. that alone was just kind of like, you know, it was flattering, and if you, a, a guy like that wanted to be in the band that bad, 
I was like, yeah, he's got to do a good job because he really wants the job. Yeah. Um, so we made it work, and you know, things worked out. Some things didn't work out. There's some things Dave could mostly do anything, but he there were some things he couldn't do too. That was very rudimentary things. <laughs> I have yeah. told the story before, but no, like, tell it, very yeah. simple beats, you know. Oh, yeah. He couldn't play a disco beat, you know, very mm. simple, up-tempo. All the limbs are kind of just doing the same thing over and over. He would do that for two measures and then fall apart. And he just couldn't do it. He couldn't play the same thing over and over. That's why he's like a lot of time. It's great in the jazz context, but it would, for straightness and pop and, 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 you know, solemn compositional levels, it was kind of hard to deal with. Um, wow. To not have someone keep something steady and, 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 and uh, minimal and loop-based sound. It was, it was very difficult. So a lot, of, a lot of records, or at least stuff, on, well, he was on a Lost Time record, there was a lot of cutting and pasting going mm. on and saying like, you know, Telephone Holiday, for example. You know. mm. That is like one measure looped really? <laughs> in those courses because it was hard for him to play anything more than a measure two without it just falling apart because wow. he's so used to just all the limbs doing like very ambidextrous things that the, the straight rigidness of all the limbs doing the same thing was just, it was mind even to me and himself. He, he couldn't believe it himself. That he couldn't, he was just laughing during this part. Like we were so upset that we were just kind of in tears laughing that he couldn't do something as simple as that. Um, wow. And you know, it was just, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. I was just like, there's certain things that I've seen in, in similar ways, like very classically trained pianists who could just fly around the keyboard but when you bring them into the studio, they can't stay on a, a, a metronome beat to save their lives. They have no concept of time. They're too busy feeling the music all the time and playing their, you know, you know, that it's, they can't play in the context of time. You know, they yeah. can't hear a metronome and just follow along. And it's, it's wild how educated some people can be, but totally miss a very basic concept of music. And yeah. I saw it a lot. And, you know, there's disadvantages to having overly educated musicians. They most definitely miss very, very important aspects of the musical process. And, you know, there are those out there. I'm not going to say, you know, the, the names, of course, but it's, yeah. it's so true that, you know, street level musics and, you know, pop culture level musics are, are you know, have a lot of educational values that need to be taught in ways that, are, are academic, and I know you know there are a lot of tech schools teaching rock and roll these days, but it's still not the same. It's it's, it's an in, intuitive thing. Yeah. You have to just know, like, and you have to identify and be sensitive to these values. And it's uh, if you're not, you know, I don't think there's any level of education that's going to teach you that. Um, even street level, you know, you just you got to know, or you, or you just don't. And um, I you know, I spent my entire life just figuring stuff out, you know, from a certain point, and. Uh, you know, a lot of that comes from, I just was, I was, you know, I was exposed to so much. I mean, the, between the 70s, 80s, and 90s, I was hit with so many kinds of music growing up. That's just like, you know, either you're figured out or you're lost, you know. And I was in a situation where I was a lot of pressure to be a musician. You know, all of, my, all of my, the members of my family were, you know, prodigies of music. They're, and being the youngest, you know, I had to make my way and, 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 represent the family and, you know, hold the family name that we're great musicians. So with that, I just learned how to think and learn how to problem solve and learn how to figure it out, everything that I could about the process of music. And one thing leads to another and I just, here I am today and it's uh, making weird stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> and just doing it on my own. Um, and now 12 Rods is basically kind of like, I, everything's done, you know, the record that's coming out is going to be, you know, I did everything from making the instruments to mastering the record. Mm. There's not one other th thing within the whole process that anyone touched. Um, mm. you I, did, the, did you play the drums? Played the drums, really? did the bass, did all the recording. I mean, I was recording my parts on drums and or singing while there's no one else in the room. I'm like bounce, running from room to room, like hitting the you know the go button. There's play bu or record wow. button, running back into the room, <sighs> calming down, singing this part. And then when it's parts up, I'm throwing down my headphones, running back into the room and hitting stop. I had no other, you know, assistance. And, you know, wow. that sort of stress of like trying to like match those two, you know, jobs at a, at a level that's, you know, perf performance, you know, ready is, you know, takes, it's a lot of, you know, ability to, to, to do it and not sound 
bad or confused or just, you know, you're just not performing right. Um, but, you know, like I said, it's just, I got lucky in the situation of having to absolutely learn these skills and given the opportunity to, like, all the time to have to fulfill these obligations to, to make music. And, uh, you know, it just kind of feeds into one another until I'm kind of a jack of all trades, kind mm -hmm. of pseudo master, or maybe a couple, maybe. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, to be honest, I, I'm not really great at any instrument either. I just had to learn them all and learn, how, learn the instrument for the job pretty quickly, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that's my role as a musician. It's just the modern musician has to pretty much learn how to do everything. Um, the, the age of the studio musician is kind of, is, is past, you know. Mm -hmm. They do, do exist and, you know. And, yeah, I mean, you know, Minneapolis, maybe yeah. Nashville, New York. Or exactly, and, and you know, but you know, we have sampling technology. We have these instruments that can do things that sound so real that you know, most producers are pretty much adopting those techniques of why get an orchestra when we can just get this huge sample pack of you know orchestra sounds from you know Vienna, you know, that are just beautiful, massive you know sample sets of. Really, you know, if, if you're playing the, the keyboard right, it's you know, nobody would know the difference. In fact, you can play really bad, you know, you know, play on any keyboard. Just play some strings, and if you mix it just right, no one will ever think it's fake. You know, mm -hmm. it's just how you play it. You know, and if you know how orchestras are arranged and how, you know, how string arrangements are, are, are written by the pros, and you listen to it and dissect it, it doesn't take that much to know that you know a sixth interval between, you know, the top and bottom note and strings is, is a great position to, like, you know, play a counter line against a melody. Um, and it's just, mm. it's stuff like that is, it, I don't know. Did I answer your question? <laughs> I don't uh, even know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, but I guess maybe it would be interesting now that you were talking about your recording technique, which is running back and forth from one room to another, but maybe like back in the day or whatever, maybe let's talk, just talk about Lost Time, for example. What was, was that done in Ev's studio in St. Paul? And, and like, what, what, what did you use? Did you do, did you work with a metronome on that stuff? How, what was your, Recording process with, with lost time. It was recorded at that at a studio that we had in St. Paul. Um, the building doesn't exist anymore, but it was right on University and like right near Menards area. Um, and uh, Ev ran the engineering for the instrumentalists who were recording for the most part. Um, and we you know we'd have Dave, we'd have Bill, and we Ev would be there manning the board. And we had a what was it? It was either like a Yamaha O2R or some other digital console that just came out that we had, I think a Yamaha uh, and it, it, it was it was early technology so they, they wouldn't sound the, the greatest I guess if you, if you had to like a beam against a you know a Neve or, or whatever but they had so much facility you could do so much with these you know we could the compressors were in there everything was programmable there was you had automated faders and it was like it, it was you know pretty awesome for that time. So we, Ev had, we had one of those and Ev would run that and we would just be treated like a normal group situation where we'd, you know, Ev would engineer and we'd go in one by one and do our parts. But at the end of the day, um, Ev would go home and I'd stick around and I'd mix the stuff and I'd edit it. Um, Ev didn't know really what to do with the editing side of it because he wasn't really hearing the song like I was. So I knew enough at that point to go like, Ev, oh, you can go home. I'm gonna mm -hmm. stick around and to take what we have and place it, edit it, whatever, maybe do some overdubs, preliminary, preliminary mixes, and um, he's like, okay, cool, I'm gonna go home. I'm like, cool, I'd be there all night, and I just forced myself to learn what we had there, and I was, you know, Ev taught me what it, you know, the basics of how to turn things on and how to operate, because the routing is very, was new, you know, we, with the digital routing, you know, matrices that we had now, it was incredibly complex. You couldn't just follow wires from, to go from here to here. You had a couple of like, you know, you know, uh, digital optical or was it AE, mm -hmm. C yeah. or something cables mm -hmm. that were just like, you know, routing lots of tracks and MIDI informations and control this and that's so that were Time just like clocks. And yeah, clocks and that you just had to like learn how to use programs. It became you know very software based, 
And, uh, and that was kind of tough to like transition into that. But once you learn it, you know, it was much easier for me to operate a studio by myself. So Lost Time was pretty much the record. It might not say that it was produced by me, I think, as one of those bones that you had to, t you know, throw off to your band, like produced by 12 Rods. Because, right. you know, if I, were to, I mean, I'd already said songs written by me. You know, I wasn't yeah. gonna say produced by me and expect that I was gonna have a band tomorrow, you know? <laughs> so, but I spent all the time myself, like m taking those raw tracks and placing them and editing them and mixing them. And, uh, you know, I thought I did pretty okay. Ev, Ev did master that record because I didn't quite understand mastering yet. Ev did, and uh, he did, he, you know, he took care of that. But as far as the mixes of that record, you know, that was the first record I, I think I even mixed. And mm -hmm. um, that's not so bad. That record. Well, thank I you. Think it sounds really clean and cool. got a lot of dynamics to it. I love that. Yeah. yeah, it was. It was. It was a. I think to me, even though we got dropped, I think. 12 rods went up like a notch or two there as yeah. far as our, our you know, sound. We had a lot more, uh, it was just facility and the, uh, just articulating the, you know, the, the parts, you know. It wasn't so much like we'd play a guitar part and didn't sound quite right. So instead of like doing it right, we just layer another guitar on top of it. And mm -hmm. it was just like four to five guitars and the same with vocals where it was just recovering up our mistakes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a lot of things were kind of I don't know so much about the Todd record or what he did with it, but you know the other records were a lot of, you know, just a lot of that naivete going on. Um, did Todd just mix that record. Todd did mix, and I think he even mastered that record. We had the opportunity to have someone else master it, but it was one of those we would <laughs> either we get like someone like Bob Ludwig to master it for just big fu uh, sum of money, or Todd would go ahead and do the mastering, and we'd save ourselves like fifteen thousand dollars. Sure. And we're like, let's do that. <laughs> Yeah. And to me, it's, I don't know, it's, it's, it's relative, and uh, of course I was biased, but you know, it wasn't the best idea, most ma mastering job. I thought at the time, people begged to differ, and I even, you know, have come around and thought differently otherwise, but. You know, I listened to that record again, like last week, and just because, mostly, but because what I've heard you say about it, and just sort of like the some of the bad vibes that happened at the time. I was expecting something a lot more, I don't know, bad. discombobulated. <laughs> like something that, but it, to me it sounds like a really put together, well, well put together record. Look, that run of songs written for that record were, was probably one of my best runs of writing. It was, once again, one of those split personality ends and the label and my A&R are going, okay, Ryan, time to write the next set of songs and Time to write that pop hit. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay. And you know, I did it. I just go, okay. I was given that job. I'm like, I wrote like 22 songs. Um, and the material I thought was some of my strongest yet. And uh, the songs are, yeah. I'm really happy with the, the songs themselves. I don't think they're, you know, and it's all so relative. But I thought, of course, at the end of the game, I thought they could have been done and produced better. Um, I had all these disgruntled, you know, thoughts going through my mind at that point. You know, the band wasn't getting along. We were in this foreign territory of Hawaii for six weeks where we just felt awkward. We were all, we're, you know, it's a, in Kauai, it's just like, you know, it's a lot of natives there. Very, and then there's this one little white town, white based town, which is like ex Hollywood stars that pretty much. You know, which where they go to die, pretty much. <laughs> and it's like, a, like, it's like Princeville or Princeton or something like that. And then everything's like Kumalama Way or it's like, excuse me for saying, but it's like, you know, it's, everything's very indigenous yeah. around it. And, you know, we're these kids from Ohio, or I'm sorry, Minneapolis, who are just wearing all black, we're all pasty white, you know, <laughs> trying, you know, trying to live through this place that we just kind of feel completely awkward and not to mention none of us are getting along. So mm. we're just like, vibes were weird um, and we, that had a lot to do with it, and expectations were high in one aspect that, oh, Todd Rundgren producing a record, it's, you guys are gonna be, you know, it's gonna be the thing that's gonna make you big, or whatever, yeah. and there was that expectation, which I don't think really mattered, and, and there was the fact that we were, it was the first record that we didn't produce ourselves, so Ev and I were just like a little, uh, you know, feeling always a little nervous about things, um, and in fact, we'd sneak into the studio late at night when we didn't think Todd was, given two shits about what was going on where we'd sneak into the studio and do some editing ourselves 
Oh, yeah. And make it seem <laughs> like, you know, you know it, it, nothing happened by the next day. We, we, we couldn't do enough to make things look like we did edit it. We'd have to, like, edit it just discreetly enough and then merge these files. And to Todd would just be like, he, he wouldn't know the difference that we edited it. It would just kind of clean things up. And so we had to be cautious with our editing because we were kind of doing it illegally. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't in our jurisdiction. It wasn't in the contract. Yeah. Um, there was enough of that to, for us to just kind of like get things a little better, but you know, we didn't have full reign of it. But we weren't, you know, our label was like, you guys are so like splintered right now and getting in, in the band, you know, uh, just relation ship with each other that we're not going to let you produce your next record <laughs> I oh. mean, so it was kind of a one of those you know it was almost a, a we were getting um i guess reprimanded <laughs> uh -huh. from because you know we were christopher and we were all just not getting along with each other we were just things were just going awry and so it was in the middle of that so all of that just compounded into this attitude that i had that this record just stinks and so I was starting to get bad reviews, and it was just kind of the tail end of our career, and things were falling apart, and, you know, it, we just felt like the, the, the butt of every joke in town. It was just, I think really? it was just bad. That it was just 12 rods is done. Everyone kind of knew it. We kind of knew it, and that was so, like, heavy that yeah. I, just, I just figured that this record sucked, and I just never listened to it. I didn't listen mm -hmm. to it for years mm -hmm. and years. Mm -hmm. But the first time I did hear it, right after we got it back, you know, I was with my friends in you know, the living room, and we were listening to it, and we're, just by the way the snare drum sounded. And I just was like, oh God, it's bad. Mm. And even my, the, you know, my friends in the room were like, oh man, I'm sorry, Ryan. <laughs> wow. You know, we were all just kind of like, this is not how I wanted it to sound, wow. sort of situation. But I was so biased. You know, yeah. I, was, I just had such a chip on my shoulder over the whole situation. I didn't want to like it probably. Mm -hmm. And you know, I just casted off those vibes so heavily that you know, it probably was okay, but you know, it just, and even now, it just, I, listened, I have listened to it recently because some of my friends are like, man, this is my favorite record. I'm like, what? Mm. No, what? So you think? I listen to it, I'm like, eh, that isn't so bad. You know, it isn't so bad, you know? So it's no, no, a lot no. of personal opinion that I just had, a, you know, bad attitude. Yeah. Well, Todd, was, he gave you, he was in, in an interview a couple, I don't know, months ago, a year ago, and he gave you guys some pretty good props in that interview. and. There was a, highly of you. I mean, that's, that's, it was surprising because it's, you know, I didn't feel like he gave too much of a shit about us at the time. I mean, he was, wasn't too personal with us, you know. He just kind of did his job and went home. And, you know, while we were, before, while we were recording, he'd be like just reading a magazine and drinking a Foster's and not really, didn't seem like he was listening at all. Um, but yeah, recently, like, I just, see, I saw like there was a gear rundown of like mm -hmm. his stuff and... Mm -hmm. He mentioned that we introduced him to, to digital amplifiers mm -hmm. in line six, and I, just, I thought he'd never like say admit to that, because you know we brought our amps to Hawaii and flew him in, and he was like, "What's what are these things?" And we're like, "Oh, this is no." Uh. He's like, "He plays through one." He's like, Poof. "Within a, a week later, he has an endorsement by them." Oh wow! And he has all these, <laughs> he flies in all these amps to himself, and I'm thinking to myself, like, "You just." Where are our amps, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and he's not admitting that, you know, we, you know, he's just not telling Line 6 or telling us or anybody that, you know, we, we, we tipped him off to these amps. And so, you know, I thought that, I thought that was a you know, slide of this pretty, pretty heavily, I thought at the time. You know, with that, I just was pretty angry. You know, we never mm. got a Line 6 endorsement, you know, they never mm. gave us the time of day, but we were the only band out there playing their, their amps. Mm -hmm. Like the only indie band out there that would touch their amps. Mm -hmm. And they still didn't give us the time of day. For whatever reason, and you know, I remember I was angry. <laughs> I remember going to your show one time, and like, first thing I noticed was like line six. I'm like, that's not indie. Yeah, that's not cool. You know, and then when you guys came out, you, you just owned it so hard. Like you made it cool to me. Like I was like, Thank okay, you. for them, they can play line yeah. six. Yeah, cool. it was one of those. Everyone, I mean, there was a couple of reasons for that. I mean, not only were we had high hopes for the digital future, unlike everyone else. You know, it was also the, the dawn of the reappreciation of old tube instruments. Mm -hmm, you know, it's totally. like that used to be like you know five years prior to that. Free, you know, you know, you could sell a twin, find a twin reaver for two hundred bucks. Yeah. But you know, all of a sudden, nine's come around. Oh no, they're twelve hundred again. Um, or and it's like there was so much of that philosophy that oh, if it's tubes, it's better. And you know, my brother and I just knew enough to be like, dude, that's such an uneducated remark mm -hmm. because. 
your amp could very well sound worse, but you're, you're thinking that because it's analog and it's tube based mm -hmm. that it's just going to be better. Mm. And we saw that so clearly that you guys are just a bunch of stupid hypocrites that were like, you know what, here's our punk rock answer to that and we're going to play the digital stuff and be like, mm, to you guys because, and we honestly, that was one of our philosophies of it and you know, you're not going to do it, we're going to do it and show you that it is, you know, going to be the future and because it's an amp. Mm -hmm. How much do you really have to care about the freaking tubes in it? It's like, you don't even know how to, how to fix a tube. What do you care about the tubes? <laughs> Yeah. So it's like, you know, it's an amp and it sounds like a guitar to me. There's a lot of options here. Yeah, you might have to tweak a few things, but, and you might have to scroll through some menus, but oh my God, look at some menus. You know, most guitarists or whoever, they're like, oh, if it has a LED screen on it, like, I don't, it's, it's not rock and roll. I'm like, well, okay, fine, whatever. Yeah. And I just, I thought it was just, just trite. It was really dumb and just kind of like, you know, one of those crutches they had to kind of like, you know, prove some sort of, superiority over over the sound of someone else and I just thought it was just a joke yeah I, we all like tube, tube amps and don't get us wrong we thought they were cool too but they were unnecessarily expensive and and they were they were break they break all the time you'd have to replace the tubes and and they wouldn't know that they sound that the guitar sounded bad and they were most often not did sound bad and but at the same time the guitar could sound like anything at that point the range of guitar tone was so vast that why wouldn't a digital amp fit within that? You know, if we made it have it our own sound and tweak it just right, no one's going to know. And in fact, we covered the face of our amps with these little lids that mm -hmm. made it look like a matchless amp. Mm -hmm. And just to tie that sort of, I mean, we, we didn't want to show it off, right. but we didn't want people to know. In fact, by the end of the show, no one ever came up to us or in fact, you know, and, and said, oh, digital amps. They'd be like, wow, how'd you, what do you do for guitar amps? Sound, guitars sound cool. I'm like, digital amplifiers. And he'd be like, you know, and see the stunned look on some people's face. Like, Really? And then their mind kind of melts a bit. And that's, you know, we kind of like that. You know, it's like, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a message. And we're not yeah. flaunting it. It's just, if you have to ask, you know, you give them a little schooling there. You know, well, and I'm not saying you're going to use it, but rather than that's what we use. Yeah. And, and stay true to that, you know, stand your ground. It's kind of like, you know, the fact that you referenced GarageBand being a $2 million studio that, you know, 40. 40 years ago or whatever. And that, I, that's the way I, sit, I look at those Line 6 amps. It was like, you had 200 amps on stage. Yeah, you had one yeah. I mean, why wouldn't you be able to get a tone that's usable? Yeah. I mean, if you can't, you're an idiot. Yeah. I mean, you just gotta like, you know, listen and maybe like accommodate your mindset to maybe more modern philosophies of how, di how, how technology is gonna work in the future, you know? And luckily, Ev was there to, to help make that happen because he was, a, you know, when he was cool, he also had to learn like the early stages of digital studio stuff. Like at that time, there was no like DAW-based system. It was like big old you know Weiss sort of boxes that were recording, you know, and they were like you know twenty thousand dollar machines and you know stuff that only like, Peter Gabriel would, could afford to have, um, and you know certain big colleges could have in their studio to teach. No one had these things. And, but luckily my brother had the advantage of learning how this stuff operates in digital, the digital future and you know, that helped us accept the future much quicker than you know, most people did in, the, in this town at least and, with, and applying that to you know, the modern state of music. It wasn't just studio, you know, geekery, tech, uncool stuff. It was like, no, these are actual amps that are cheaper and are better, or not better, but yes, they actually have more facility. They can yeah. do more, and in fact, they'll be more resilient in the end run. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, but you know, it just, that wasn't going to people's mind. It was being so forced that you had to have a twin reverb, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And it was, it was just shoved down everyone's throat. And there was not one person or band that would agree, could agree with us because, because they were uneducated. They were too caught up in the culture, culture movement of, you know, was, look back at that era. It was just, it was just so many hypocritical yeah. <laughs> situations. As much as I loved the movements, you know, it's just, there was, people doing things that they said they weren't doing or, and, and so forth, you know, and the band's getting signed to major labels while they're hating major labels, you know? Yeah. We're punk rock, but we're on fucking Warner Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you guys suck. So, yeah. oh, do we have our other phone? Tell a bit about the songs in the new record. Are they completely new recording of old demos or more like older songs that are now with fresh ideas? Uh, I guess a little bit of both. Um, there are old songs. Um, uh, that were demoed 
uh, for the purpose of being the next phase after Lost Time. So we were starting to play some of those songs, some of these songs live, you know, in the old incarnation of 12 Rods, before we just kind of fell apart. Um, so these songs were demoed and sitting around for 20 plus years. And when the time came about a year ago, I just had an opportunity to record them for real. And it was something I knew I was going to do eventually because the songs were, were still in my head. And I, I was, you know, there were some, at that point I was kind of on a stride of writing pretty, I was pretty confident in, in these songs, in other words. And I was, knew I was going to eventually release them somehow. Um, and I thought I'd be like, you know, here's some, I'll re-record them, you know, with the, the, the uh, tools I have today tried my best not to make it sound that I was influenced by all that I've been through. Like, I didn't want to put any circuit bending on it or do, like, you know, pitch-related stuff. I didn't make it, try to make it sound like it was the record that literally came right after Lost Time. So it had to have that same, you know, somewhat clean sound, that, you know, unprocessed. Um, so I, had, I made that, uh, I guess, workflow happen, and it... So it's, but yeah, there have been a few, not rewrites, but just, you know, I'd fix a few lyrics, maybe rewrite a bridge once or twice, but pretty much the songs are as they were when they're written as demos. They're just played um, with a real drummer, or at least played with live drums um, and other instruments. I mean, the demo is, is a drum, your drum machine, and, uh, you know, the parts are a little more messy or whatever, but um, I just, you know, refined the instrumental instrumentation and uh, fixed a couple lyrics. Um, but yeah, their old songs re just cleaned up but stayed true. They stay, stay, stay true to how, how the song was originally written. Um, uh, but yeah, and now they're going to be performed in a pretty streamlined way with a new group. Um, probably not absolutely verbatim like the song, but you know, as close as we can. Uh, and yet, I, I played all the instruments, so the drum parts aren't, I don't want to say, they're not like flamboyantly characteristic, like say a Dave part or a Christopher part. There's a lot of more straight beats of how I would have either written the demo mm -hmm. part on the drum, or the drum machine. Um, but I would just say, you know, much more Mick Fleetwoodism going on, you know. A lot more of that rather than, you know, you know, stuff. Um, which I didn't always thought accommodated the song as, you know, uh, you know, as needed. I think a lot of what was left in those old Twelve Rods records, as became it became characteristic characteristics of the band. I think like uh, all those little whippity snappity things that drummers would do, aren't essential components of the song. So there was a couple times that you know I probably play a whippity fill, but it was not done um, frequently. But I know. There will be a contingency of people out there that are like, kind of want to hear that too. So I had to do maybe just enough of that to um, fulfill an expectation, of course. Um, but they are just pretty much the songs as they were recorded in their demo stage years ago. Um, but with uh, me playing the instruments as I would, you know, live, it's pretty pared down. In fact, this record I think is recorded and designed more so like a real band than it's ever had before. I mean, all of our other songs had this extra samples, keyboards, layered parts, massive harmonies or whatever that aren't too realistic in a band scenario, you know? Um, so this record is like one or two guitars, bass, drums, a little bit of keyboard maybe, and not too many harmonies at all. It's just, uh, it's, it's stripped down and, uh, sounds like a band, which is to me kind of ironic being I'm the only person playing on it, but it sounds to me like the very performable, feasible situation <laughs> rather than like, oh God, how are we going to perform that? Oh God, we got to whip out samples because I, no one, we don't have enough members to play that part sort of stuff. So back then we had to cheat with samples and keyboards doing all this extraneous stuff, but, but I think everything was pared, is pared down to a very appropriate level um, that represents the songs as they should be. Um, and the record wasn't, to me, expected to be anything more than like, here's a little B-sides thing that, you know, throughout this, but it got accepted and it got signed as a record that's like, 
this is the next 12 Rods record. We expect you to tour now because, you know, labels were interested, picked it up, and they're like, okay, when are you going to tour? When do you want to go on the road? I'm like, I don't have a band. So it's like, <laughs> under their influence, you know, I have to like, you know, I had to put together a band to perform, you know, the first half show and go on the road. And uh, it's kind of wild to have to be in that situation where it's, here's my second chance, but I got to do it with like, this new formula and, uh, and so forth. So it's, um, it's like one of those situations where it's like, <laughs> I get the rare opportunity to be like, if you were able to do something in your past that you, as old as you are now, would you do it or do it the same way, you know, or mm. one of those sort of, philo- you know, big, you know, meta questions that, uh, you know, I like, wow, okay, I, I do get a second chance to do certain things and now I'm, and I have more support than I think I've ever had before. Mm. I have a publicist, I have PR, I have booking, I have a whole label that's, you know, throwing, two, two labels that are throwing down. And I'm like, I didn't expect this to really happen, you know? And in fact, I didn't want to do it. And it's not like the ideal thing I, I want to do, but it's an obligation that I had to kind of embrace. Mm. Um, it was kind of a demand. I mean, not only in order to be released, these labels kind of wanted, you know, to be ful- fulfills their expectations because they're thrown down. So they want me to be a band again, or 12 Rocks to be a band again, um, you know. You know, r- throwing it down real here, I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd ra- much rather be working on pitch stuff. I'd much rather be, you know, progressing my art in that way. But I- I'm not going to say I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to enjoy what I'm going to do because it's one of those incredible challenges that I got to live up to. And, uh, I- and I accept and I embrace um, because it's how it's always been. It's always been one of those tasks thrown at me that this is the wrong time to put- do this task. And you're, it's just, how am I going to do this? And, it's just, it's happened just like clockwork. Just, you know, hey, Ryan, here's something that we want you to do. In fact, you're now obligated to do this, but it just comes at the wrong time in my life. But it's not to say it was wrong because things kind of coincidentally worked out in a way where I, it is going to be great and it is supposed to happen like this. It's just really thick and layered and, and it takes time for me to see you know, that this is actually perfect. You know, this is really interesting to I mean, I never thought in a million years I'd, I'd, I'd be getting back into 12 rods. Mm. I mean, mm-hmm. I never thought I'd want to have, want or, I mean, having to sing like this, like that, was uh, very hard. I mean, I wrote parts accidentally that were incredibly stressful to sing. You know, I'm starting to get nodes. You know, I'd blow out my ears. I'd be like, we'd be playing so loud. You know, I'd, just, I'd be screaming all the time that, you know, throwing out my voice. And I didn't want to do that anymore. I just, I just how am I going to, How's that going to age, you know? Um, all that aggro energy anyway. And so with this new record, it's like, there's this happy medium that I, I have to like sing like that again, but I had to find a way slash also, you know, stay true to the song I wrote back then, which is, yeah, I wrote a part that was really compli- complicated. I have to sing it like that because that's how the melody went. And also, you know, now that I, I feel like I've gone through what I have, and I am, am can be a better singer. Um, and I, through all this, I have become a better singer than I was then. The parts are like, you know, I set the bar really high for myself because through my editing and through my through the new, just my new techniques, I've learned how to like make voices sound pretty good. And so when I made my voice sound pretty good and listened to it, and, you know, and, you know, on the playback, I'm like, that sounds great, Ryan, but that's not really hard to sing hmm. for real. You know, all the intervals, and I have to, like, you know, one line just, like, jumps an octave and a half. Mm. It's like, ooh, and I'm playing guitar at the same time. It's like, you know, to be able to play that accurately live, it's really hard. Mm. And I'm not screaming, but I'm just, like, singing these very intricate lines that are, you know. I learned better than to do that, like, say, Mystery Palace and Beyond, where I started singing three notes, and within this range, it's like this. And, Mm. oh, it's great to do. It's like, oh, what a relaxing thing to do. Mm -hmm. But, you know. In order to stay true to the sound of 12 rods, you know, it's, those parts are like all over the place singing wise and, it's, and the melodies are pretty intricate. And getting back into that, you know, I've had to practice a lot more and, and uh, develop my voice again. Yeah, it's just, I don't like practicing, but I have to like go in nearly every day and sing to my record and try and mm. like get that muscle memory back and learn how to sing and play guitars and, you know, different rhythms and, 
and it's you know it's not easy, but it's it's coming back to me. It's and it's gonna be it's gonna be great. It's just a you know there was a time, and for many many years, I just thought I would never have to do that again. I was just thanking that I would never have to do that again because it, it's 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 I don't want to say it's not fun. It's just you know a, a lot of obligation to be able to play these intricate chords and jump around like that and sing like cleanly those accurate notes um, as I wrote them. Um, so I'm kind of like, I shot myself in the foot because I made it, you know, it's a, this record that's coming out, it's more of a vocal record than anything, you know. Mm. Kind of, people might think and were probably thinking that it was going to be a guitar-based record because that's kind of where my process ideas kind of are going, we're going, but just to stay true to how these songs are written and composed, the melody and that vocal line is the most important thing. And being a producer, I realized that my voice is mixed out up front, you know, unlike, you know, what I tried to bury it, you know, and it was in vogue back then to bury your voice, you know, and, you know, and we could, you know, it was a way of getting away with murder, you know, it's like, oh, your voice doesn't sound good right there, just keep it on the mix, <laughs> it's, it's cool anyway. But it's not like that anymore, and uh, I just learned to refine my voice and my technique to like, it has to be heard like that, so. It, it, it sets me up for a big challenge of, uh, well, a lot of work ahead. Um, but it's just one of those things where it's just, I, I mean, when I look back at it, every scenario musically has, has been this sort of situation where it's just, I'm not like, it's like an obligation, more so than it's something I feel like I have to do. But it, the fact of the matter is, is it is something I have to do. And I'm just, I'm answering to a calling that's much bigger than me. Hmm. And, that's cool. and I accept it and I embrace it and try to even exceed the expectations mm -hmm. that are given. Um, or expected so, so it's are a, you uh, will you be on tour quite a bit this summer or I don't know yet okay. I mean it's a, it depends on how things unfold I mean I have a booking agent who's who's uh, you know eager to just get going on this and uh, you know uh, one of the labels is in France so it's like they're gonna want us to do European stuff and um, everyone I know it's I, I, we will be touring I, to the extent of it it all depends on I guess how things pan out in certain ways how long we can last, you know, who's, <laughs> there's a lot of other X factors involved. I'm ready to go. I'm, you know, honestly, I'll, I'll, I'll fulfill whatever needs at this point. Um, it's what I've signed myself up to do, voluntarily or not, it just is what it is. Um, it's like going off to duty, you know. Do you have, uh, like, are there p pockets in the U.S. or in the world, Europe, where, like, you have, a, like, a chunk of fans that are, into yeah. It or what? Um, Poland. Poland. I've never played Poland, but it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of interesting because um, I am Polish. Mm. Um, didn't know that till much later in my life because when I was young, I was told I was Aust uh, Austrian. Mm. But there's a lot of Polish jokes back in the '80s, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think my parents knew that, and so they didn't tell me I was Polish until much later, like mm. until the '90s. And they said, "Yeah, well, you're mostly Polish." And I don't know if it's a, like a DNA thing or whatever, but Polish, the Polish really, really identify with how I write, I guess. And I don't know if that's, maybe I write in a Polish style. Mm. Um, you know, it's quite possible, I guess. Um, I don't even know it. Um, I guess it's bound to happen. Um, there's also like in Belgium okay. uh, and, and like Brazil. Uh, yeah, like hot markets for us. Got a lot of people buying stuff. Got a lot, got a lot of, you know, emails from territories like that. Never played these territories, but yeah, so there will be an audience here and there. Um, Are you going to go to Brazil? Does it, I, I hope so. I mean, it's, wow. I, I guess, I, don't, well, I, I mean, I, I can't say that we are or aren't. I just think that yeah, the muscle behind what I have now is, believe it or not, much stronger than we've ever had before. Wow. Um, major label, no major label. I mean, what, what I have underneath me is a staff of people who are so gung-ho about what's going on. Happy that 12 Rods are back together, st stoked about the music, blah, 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 and just really into the whole legacy of, of it all, and everyone is. And they're just, they're so happy that it's just like, you know, before it was just like, you know, they were just major label, most of the people who didn't even like us, didn't right. like the members, or just always had some sort of hang up on something about us and never fully put their all into it. Mm. And it's, we had so many problems with, with that. That we couldn't really get anyone underneath us, um, right? Anymore, it's tables have turned. You know, people are underneath it, and without even asking. And th something happened along the way. You know, I don't know what, but it's. I mean, I have some speculations, but it's all online based. 
I think that certain online communities have come to some conclusions about us and deemed us a band that's worthy of noti- no, some sort of notoriety. Never thought it'd see the day. You know, I thought 12 Rods was gone forever. And I just went, screw it, I'm going on. You know, I wasn't going to try and rekindle or relive anything, didn't want to. But, you know, things like the reunion show in, in 2015, you know, that was all Justin Vernon's idea. Mm. And I didn't really want to do that. But, you know, it was... And then after that, it just kind of ramped up to this, like, you know, people were like, you know, my label, one's in New York and Brooklyn, and they're like, man, 12 Rods is hotter than ever right now. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, everyone, everywhere I go, everyone I know is super pumped on 12 Rods. I'm like, you guys are like one of the most popular bands around right now. I'm like, what are you? I'm like, my, uh, um, and I can only attribute that to like, you know, the, 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 the 10 and Pitchfork or Todd Rundgren connections or some news like that that has actually stood, that stood the test of time. And because you know, our names are tied to it, people do a lot of investigative work and mm-hmm. listening, you know, because there's no push. I mean, like, I Wish You Were a Girl song has like 1.5 million listens, you know, and I'm like, there was no corporate or any push. I didn't even put, no one that I know of in, in the band or myself put that online in that situation, but on its own accord, absolutely, you know, grassroots level, that got like millions of views. I'm like, and listen. Is that Spotify or? It's a Spotify okay. thing. And I'm, it kind of blows me away. And in, from what I've been told, and, and, and from numerous sources, is that you know, furries are really into Twelve Rods. Wow. We're like the first official furry band. Wow. <laughs> and there's like you know paintings and you know, and things online that indicate that furries really like, especially the Lost Time record, for obvious reasons. They had the animals yeah. and they on the crescent face and. Yeah. They see that and it's like, oh, let's listen. They, you know, some furry probably saw that in a store and, and were like, oh, it's, I like animals. That's, yeah. you know, and listened to it and might, might have actually liked the record and shared it with his other furry friends and, and stuff like that. And, and the you furry know, conventions. Yeah, exactly. I, mean, I don't know who, how that pans out in the future. I mean, none of us, you know, our furries, not, furries are cool. I mean, we're, it's whatever. It's, it's, it's an intriguing subculture of the world. But it's... Uh, Nothing we're directly involved with, but I'm happy that, very happy that they've embraced us like that, you know? Yeah. LGBT communities really love the song, like, I wish you were a girl, mm-hmm. you know, trans yeah. communities. And it, it's, it's wonderful, you know? It's, that's half the reason, I think, why that, you know, that I wish you were a girl song is, is popular, because it has the themes of, you know, yeah. of transgenderisms and so forth. That, that was the second song I ever wrote in my life. I was 18 years old. Wow. You know, and that's the biggest song I have. Interesting. Zero push. I didn't, I just, it kind of blows me away. Yeah. So indications like that are just, you know, Do you, there is a, a Does any of that translate to checks in the mail or anything like Hell that? Hell no. Really? We were that screwed to where, I don't, I mean, I, yearly, the, the publishing and the rights to those songs are shifted around and traded between publishing house to publishing house that I can't keep up with it. I just know right now that Universal Records owns pretty much most of my content, and, or um, what is it, Music uh, Entertainment One in Europe. And they're like those big conglomerates, those umbrella you know, corporations that own everything else sort of things. They own the rights. Mm. And we, it's hard, even though I'm, I'm, I'm justified to get them back, because um, all its contracts are well over 10 years old. Mm-hmm. And, you know, rightfully so, I should be getting these rights back, but it's so hard to contact. We've tried to contact so many different people, mm-hmm. and it's just like, you know, you're just running in circles here. We can't figure it out. And yeah. it's, it's a code. You know, there's like this elite hierarchy of, you know, the way you have to talk, who you have to know that you're not privy to yet, apparently, because we just can't find the right people to obtain our, the rights back. Um, hopefully we will. Um, because people are asking for reissues. Yeah. You know, vinyl reissues of all our old records would be a great and ideal, but those who have, are holding on to those rights aren't doing anything. They're sitting on them and just kind of like, you know, it's squandering this stuff, and it's really frustrating. And I'm, we're hoping to God to rectify this. You don't have anything with Sony, do you? Maybe. Because okay, I, <laughs> I, I talk, we should talk if you do, because I know somebody with Sony. I mean, it's... If, if Sony's affiliated somehow with Universal, I know Universal somehow has the absolute rights, in, in, at least in the States or in this, these territories. Mm-hmm. Um, 
which is kind of interesting because they're the label that like anymore puts out you know here's the discography of Elvis here's all of Johnny mm-hmm. Cash's stuff here's mm-hmm. you know they do that stuff and which means they go hey I'm, that's awesome because maybe in the future they'll do a 12 rods discography thing because yeah. that's you know cross your fingers maybe that's what it's all set up for but other than that um, they're not doing anything with it and that's it's just and they're they're not like even lending a hand to like see the situation that we and crowds and fans want these reissues and are helping anyone out about it they're just laying silent about it and not you know giving us the time of day and it's really yeah. frustrating and, yeah, but you know we're hoping to work this stuff out I think the demand of it will come to a head at some point and we'll through these the next months years or whatever 12 rods you know whatever it turns into will help bring this to light more and will help get, garner the attention to uh, make this you know an absolute what needs to get done I mean the fact sure. that not, those older records don't have any vinyl it's just kind of pathetic yeah yeah it's uh, it's, it's kind of sad and it's a little embarrassing because people ask for it all the time I'm like Ugh, believe it or not I have no idea where my music is <laughs> so it's, it, what would happen if you just said fuck it I'm just gonna reissue it myself we've thought about that and you know if you know it would if anything bring that issue to light and if we were to have problems we'd have that confrontation and we'd have mm-hmm. to have that discussion yeah you know uh, and uh, and and it would be in a public light mm-hmm. um which would help massage our side of it mm-hmm. um so we've thought about just doing it and crossing that bridge when it when it comes up and mm-hmm. at least you know, you know who to talk to exactly <laughs> you know seriously they would they would come out and if it was a problem you know obviously it would and we've thought about that, but the labels that we're with now, you know, of course, are hesitant to take that route because, you know, that's that's if you have a label like that, you know, there's a lot more legalities you have to deal with. Well, they got a, yeah, they got it, a lot of money on the line now for what you're gonna do. They want to at least recoup that, probably. Yeah. You know, and, yeah, they don't want to mess up their businesses on, you know, off this necessity. You know, yeah. but if that were to be done, it would have to be done by some secret white labels, you know, or, or something that doesn't have a tie to a label per se, so to avoid any like, well, legal matters Where that are pretty come serious. From? Yeah, exactly. Oh <laughs> my God! Oh, just, uh, woke up one morning and there they were. Yeah. You know, we'd have to. Might, <laughs> we've thought about taking that approach, um, but we'll we'll see. I mean, uh, yeah, this next few months when the record comes out, just a lot's going to be set in motion to where I'd be able to, you know, have a clear light as to how this act is going to pan out because yeah. it's really hard. I mean, as close as this show is. I have no idea how the second half of this year is going to be. None. It's, I can't f- really understand. Mm. Like, I mean, it could be things that I've always wished. It could, and it probably won't, but you know, be an utter disappointment. I just don't know how. It's, it's, I feel like I'm in this kind of weird limbo world of like, you know, and have for a long time of like, you know, the middle ground between, you know, success and, you know, just obscurity mm-hmm. to where it's, this could be it. It's, I mean, I, it, there's no reason why this shouldn't be like, you know, the thing that would, "Quote unquote," you know, break you know the twelve rods thing, or yeah. or not. I mean, but it seems like all the signs of it all. I mean, it's, it's the fact that I wasn't. I have I had no input on like setting this whole off. You know, it was everyone else's idea to get this in motion again, more or less. That it just seems like that's a demand that is so natural and real and unforced that how could it go wrong? You know, mm-hmm. you know, as long as I just do what I have to do. Um, and you know, keep a cool head about it. it. Should be, it should do just what it's meant to do. Hopefully. Yeah. So. Does Darian have it? Okay. Any chance of new twelve rod songs in the future, or any other music you're currently working on? Um. Yeah, I thought about that. Yes, there's a uh, even more demos that were written back then that were less finished. Another seven, eight songs that I have um, on my computer still that are pretty cool songs that could very easily be you know future 12 rods record um they do exist and listening to them i'm like yeah there's total you know possibility that these might be learned and uh recorded in the next year or two i suppose um and you know i've already written you know just because i've been playing more guitar you know messing around you know there's a couple ideas that you know have come up that been like yeah definitely could be a new 12 rod song um I'm not gonna uh, just 
you know, disregard the whole idea of uh, continuing, you know, an actual conceptual band of 12 rods and writing just like we used to um, at all. It might just happen if it's, you know, I'm, I'm willing to, to, to go there because I do have the material written, half written or whatever. And, uh, but like I said, it's just going to have to be how, uh, based off how, how things play, everything plays out. I mean, I could be asked to do something. I could just have an inclination just to, to finish off a certain record at a certain point, but it's absolutely a possibility, you know? Right now, like I said, I already have most of our record probably more or less written. It's just not finished. Um, but the time will come, and it's inevitable that it will come. Um, usually most things that I write will are most definitely finished and released. I don't try to write things and forget about them, ever. It's just, I have that urge to, like, if I'm going to commit myself to any level to a song, it's going to be released. Um, so, I mean, there's that. But there's also, I also have a lot of C. Costra stuff, a lot of Food Team stuff, a lot of Crux Pond stuff, a lot of, well, both sides of C. Costra, the guitar stuff and the R&B stuff um, that I have backlogged, that I've written, that actually I have three records that are done that I just haven't had time to release yet based off those respective wow. groups. So, there's always something to do. It's just like, you know, how much time do I have in a day? You know, I, I have like four or five different projects. I could go any which way at any time. It's just like what makes the most sense. Um, if I have time between like, you know, 12 Rods projects or whatever at this day and age, yeah, I'm gonna attack, you know, my Sea Castra and some pitch stuff and make some more records um, like that. And I plan to keep that forever. Just, I, apparently I have like no loss of ideas. I have so much, so many things I could release right now immediately slash I could write forever. Um, that's just how it's going to be. So there will be something in the future. I can't say what and when, but um, expect more music until I'm dead. <laughs> well, with that, yeah. thank you so much, Ryan. Dude, thank you it's so much. Really Absolutely. Good, good interview. So bye, Darian. And uh, thank you very much for coming along. <laughs>